Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, this uh, webinar. So this is the first panel of the um, Affirmative Feminism seminar series. And I'm very, I'm very sorry for um, the delay. Uh, we're starting a bit late. Uh, we had uh, obviously some uh, technical issue that's uh, unavoidable <laughs> uh, in a digital meeting like this. Um, so I'll just say a few words uh, about myself and the seminar, and then I'll introduce uh, the panelists. So I'm Maud Kutrick. I'm a researcher in film studies and digital culture at the University of Bergen. And uh, this seminar series has um, come together as um, a, an observation, as a recent observation that uh, we can't only look at what happens on screen anymore, but we do have to look at the whole uh, life cycle of a film um, from uh, production to distribution if we want to tackle uh, discriminations and inclusivity and diversity um, on, um, on screen and in the film and screen culture. So um, this has also come from uh, an idea um, that I had with my previous research on uh, affirmative aesthetics. And, um, and this um, affirmative uh, idea that uh, originally comes from uh, Rosie Braidotti is um, the idea that we also have to, uh, for changes to um, happen, we also have to uh, look beyond a certain lamentation of the status quo and uh, look beyond the negativity that there is around um, looking at binaries, um, binaries of gender, of class, race, and sexuality, and that we need to look for alternatives. So I've um, put together uh, those three panels. So the first, this first one will be on uh, production policies and networks, and the following ones will be on uh, aesthetic representation and curation and distribution. So um, today I want to uh, welcome um, Amanda Coles, who is um, a researcher in uh, arts and culture management. Um, uh yes i don't know if you can turn on your camera amanda yes hello <laughs> i sorry was that my cue mode <laughs> yes <laughs> um so uh welcome uh you're a researcher in arts and cultural management and employment relations at deacon university um, I'll also want to welcome uh, Helen uh, Krangvist, uh, who is a producer and a president of the network uh, Women in Film and Television International. Um, I know that Helen ha has had some uh, technical issues, so I hope that um, she'll manage um, very soon um, uh, to, to be with us. And uh, I'll also like to uh, introduce Marcela Stoltzman, who is um, producer at Ato Ato Pictures. Um, hello. Um, and uh, this is a production company, awesome production company, who has uh, made um, interactive fictions and VR. Um, and they are based in um, Amsterdam. So um, I first, uh, and also I'll uh, introduce uh, Emily Wright, who is an artist and the research assistant. Um, and uh, hello. Hi. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, and uh, she'll give us some uh, house rules before we start the, the webinar. Hi, all. Uh, so I'll be here today moderating the chat and uh, I'll be active in the Q&A. There's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, so if anything pressing comes up during the conversation, please feel free to uh, raise your hand and uh, interact with a question or you can drop a question in the Q&A button and then uh, use the chat panel um, to also engage with the audience and panelists. Uh, we'll also be recording uh, today, so just so you all know that the yeah the panel will be recorded for uh, research and distribution later on. Thank you. Um, so I've all asked the, the panelists to uh, reflect a bit on this um, affirmative uh, topic and on um, and on inclusion and diversity, um, especially through how can we uh, change production, the production side and the policy side. 
um, of um, of the life uh, of a film in um, or interactive fictions. So um, I, I'd like first to uh, ask Amanda Kohls uh, what she thinks, um, how she thinks that her work could be affirmative or what has she encountered in her work as, um, as affirmative production in a way. Thank you, Maud. I really enjoy the assignment that you've given me and it's prompted me to think about things in a new way, which is a rich terrain indeed. Um, it's really an honor to be invited to participate. So thank you to both you and Emily for doing such a great job on bringing all of this together. Thank you to my co-panelists with whom I have the pleasure of spending my Friday night all the way from Melbourne. And indeed, thank you to our digital audience uh, whom I can't see, but I'm looking forward to hearing from over the course of the next few hours. Uh, before I proceed, though, I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land throughout Australia and the world, and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. I acknowledge that I am participating in this gathering from the lands of the from the excuse me <clears throat> lands of the Yalhulet Willem of the Boonwurrung country that makes up the greater. Kulin Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work and live today and pay my respects to elders past and present. I also acknowledge and pay my respects to First Nations people joining us in this gathering. I'd like to open up with uh, the task that you've given us, Maud, um, by drawing from a quote from a recent publication that I co-authored with my colleagues in the Kinematics Project. Um, and I'm also proud to note that that includes Scotty Leist, who will be up on the third, the third panel of the seminar in this series. Um, and I want to draw from this because I think it really speaks to my affirmative politics. Kinematics is a scholarly feminist interventionist research project that aims to make both the academy and the world in which it operates a better place to live, work, and create. This means kinematics has a dual focus, both as a reflexive set of relationships between scholars working within the network and as a high impact interdisciplinary feminist research network. We are evidence-based, data-driven, and world-facing. Acknowledging that our reciprocal interactions, um, that our interactions are reciprocal with the industries and communities that we study. And we start from the premise that all relationships, those between the academics within the network, our relationships with our respective universities, with our research communities, and indeed with our data are inscribed and informed by power relations. We seek to interrogate examine and question those power relations and the consequences that they produce for our research and the communities with whom we produce our research. The project is based on core feminist values that seek not only to name but redress systemic inequality using data as an interventionist tool. So you can see it's, we have very minor small goals about what we want the world to look like. All of that to say that I consider myself an activist academic, which mode, if I'm responding to your framing of affirmative stance correctly, gets me at least part of the way to responding to the panel's core questions. Activism, I want us to think about some of the, um, the very basic, simple concepts that we use every day um, and interrogate what they mean and why they matter in these kinds of discussions. So activism at its most basic is a concerted focused effort to bring about change, either by advocating for a particular pathway or a decision or a set of actions, or perhaps opposing a particular pathway or action or set of actions. Activism is often concerned with how to change the world in terms of its social, political, economic, cultural, and or environmental trajectory. Many, many, many people engage in activism, but not all people who engage in activism consider themselves activists. 
So that's point number one. Furthermore, for while activism and activists are often associated with progressive political or social causes, this is not always the case. We can see this in these very difficult political times where there is a rising tide of activism that wants to change the world in ways that I would imagine most of us do not see as progressive. And as a feminist activist, I am again arguing that we need to constantly in interrogate and revisit these basic concepts like activism that we take for granted because they can impact the, world's, the world in ways which are not affirmative. And that brings me to the question of stories and the role that they play in society and how we mobilize the idea of stories as tools, as activist tools, particularly in the sectors that we're seeking to intervene in. And I think we should be careful sometimes about how we talk about stories because of course that story can challenge and inform and they can empower and they can inspire. But some stories or the absence of stories can also function as spaces of exclusion and marginalization and disenfranchisement from our public sphere and from each other. Therefore, all of that to say, we need to pay very careful attention about who is telling their stories, where they are telling their stories, and the various ways in which we value the stories that are being told. So let me draw from the words of Nigerian novelist Chimamanda Idichie, whom I'm sure many of you know already, as she presents in her iconic TED Talk, The Dangers of a Single Story. And if you haven't seen it, you must. In talking about the power of stories, Adichie refers to the Nigerian word ngali as a noun that loosely translates to be greater than another. She continues, like our economic and political worlds, stories too are defined by the principle of ngali, how they are told, who tells them, when they're told, how many stories are told are really dependent on power. So I have spent my academic career attempting with various degrees of success and with a wide range of industry partners, including advocacy organizations like women in film and television and unions and guilds and professional associations and policymakers to interrogate, understand and disrupt the existing power relations that produce systemic intersectional inequality in the global screen industries. And I do this using the academic skills and training that I've gained during my years of schooling and the knowledge of the industry norms and practices that comes from my professional history in film and TV production and my international networks that run through both academic and professional communities of practice. So in thinking about this work, this, was a, this prompted some really serious reflection and I, I thank you for providing me with the opportunity to do this kind of work. I need to share uh, with everyone that I often feel as if I get more affirmative interventions from my work than I deliver. So when Women in Film and Television Vancouver presented me with the Please Adjust Your Set Award at their 20th anniversary gala for providing essential analysis and data that has assisted in launching new policies and programs designed to address structural impediments to gender equity and inclusion in the Canadian film and tel television industry, needless to say, I was more than a little honored. And let me tell you why. My approach to my work is deeply relational. It comes from careful listening to industry stakeholders from across the entire screen ecology, from individual workers, to unions and guilds and professional associations, to small to medium enterprises, independent producers and global media giant, giants, and public and private funding and financing bodies. I listen for what is being said and where the silences are. And then I 
try to see if there's a role for me and my skills to play in challenging what we know and what is known and what those silences tell us about power, voice, and agency in our collective quest for equality. And I'm just gonna wrap up by saying this. My academic practice provides me with an enormous amount of privilege. That comes in the form of expert knowledge to some degree, but moreover in the time and the institutional resources to sit back and analyze the big picture, if you will, using those skills to make sense of all the activity that's happening on the ground to really drive that change. So my privilege also comes in the form of access to the stories of the storytellers. And when I say I get more from my work, I think, than I give, this is where I really want to focus. Now, look, I interview a lot of elites. I interview network executives. I interview union bosses. I interview uh, heads of major policy institutes. And that tells me a lot, a lot about power. But my research also involves conducting focus groups and interviews with women who are struggling to tell their stories. And sometimes they are struggling to tell any story. This involves queer and non-binary women and black women, South Asian women and working class women and indigenous women storytellers. And they take their time, their histories, their wisdom, their power, and they share it with me. They share their personal and professional stories about the joys, but also the deeply painful, scarring and enraging encounters with systemic white colonial patriarchy under contemporary capitalism in the global screen industries. These stories which they entrust in me are my privilege to hear and my moral, ethical and feminist responsibility to use in a fight for equity and justice. Thank you. That was wonderful. That was, uh, yeah, a very uh, great reflection of um, exactly what I was uh, waiting for, or actually much more than what I was waiting for. So thank you very much. <laughs> I'm glad I hit the brief. <laughs> Um, so um, before we uh, engage with all the fantastic points that you've uh, that you've made, um, I'd like to invite uh, Helen to uh, give us a um, thought on the on the topic. Yeah, I, I will I will do it as a reflection what Amanda said, and and when you talked about. Uh, being an activist, I have things I say, you know, you, you get, you have things you carry with you uh, and then you say them over and over again. And one thing I've been saying the last two years, I think, is what does it mean to be an activist? And, and my description is to be an activist is to be in a room where people have quite a good time and they are enjoying themselves. And you have to be the one who raise your hand and, says, and say, I'm sorry, it's not good for everyone. And then you have to create this vibe of, of, of when it's not uncomfortable, when it's uncomfortable and, and to carry this burden of being uncomfortable, that is what is, it is to be an activist, I think. And, and I think I struggle every day of my life if I should go into that room where it is uncomfortable for me to be the one who point my finger at something that I think is wrong, or, or if I should be in this room that I'm privileged to be, I, I am the president of WIFT International, I'm also the president of WIFT Sweden, I'm very active in very many networks of fantastic women from all places in the world, representing so many cultures, so many different experiences, and maybe we are people that really don't understand each other, but when we are in this room together, we have this urge for change. And that gives this vibe. I can feel it in my body right now being here with you because I get, I told someone, I look like an ugly chicken on my arms because I have so much ghost bumps. It's almost embarrassing. These rooms that I'm privileged to spend so much of my life in 
I don't know if I feel like an activist in this room. In, in these rooms, I feel that I am together with people and, and we don't really know what we are striving for. We know what we want to leave, but we also know that we have to share the common journey into a mystery of creating something that have not yet been defined. But we know there are some, there are some seeds. When you read this, I don't know what you call it in Australia. I'm, I'm always jealous when I'm in Australia or Canada, when you start to read this reconciliation words to, to, to mention and articulate a problem and your excuses for that, these problems. And I'm so jealous because in Sweden, where I live, we don't talk about it. We don't touch it. We all know about it, but we have not yet come to that point where it's so important. It has to, some, so to say, create rules for the rooms we are in. That was my reflection on you. And then I started to think, how the heck do I become an activist? Uh, or, or, or when did I start to define it? And then I found out I must have been born that way. My mother was almost blind. She was a single mother, she was overweight, but she had this idea that she could make change. So that's what I grew up with. And she was totally, there was everything wrong with her, but she never had that look at herself, but the world had that look at her. And I, I have been very sensitive to that concept since I was a little kid. And I, right now listening to you, Amanda, I found out, fuck, she made me an activist because what she gave to me, and this is my point, I see a world with a lot of people that don't think that what they do really matter. And, and actually in Sweden, that's the biggest health issue we have, that people look at themselves, that doesn't matter what I do, because the, the, the world will go on anyway. But I think to think that you are a person that matter, not more than you or you or you, but I do matter and what I do will matter for our common good. That was something I got. And, and listening to you, Amanda, I, I said, I'm so grateful to my mother. She's been dead forever, but wow, I've got that. And maybe that was the richest gift I could have. So uh, I will not give you my whole life, but I will try to, to share some points in my life that has made change for me because I was sure that I wanted to do something in my life that worked for change. And I was looking at journalism or art. I started with theater, I then went on to film. I was educated as a production designer. I was really entering our industry. I was 16 when I started. I was entering our industry from the art dimension and I was good at it. I worked a lot, I produced a lot, I had really good times. I, I, was, I had a career, but I was always fighting, always fighting. And I came to an end where I said, I can't limit myself with all these fights. And then I told myself, I have to learn about money and power. So I decided to start a company. I started a, a TV channel, crazy thing. I actually did it, but I, and I did it to come put myself in a position where I could be in charge of my own life. At that time, I didn't call me a feminist. I was an environmental activist. I was very engaged since the, the meeting in Rio in 94 in sustainable development. And, and what I learned in, in that activism was that the most efficient way to change the world to a more sustainable, sustainable place is to invest in women, give more space and power to women. Uh, then, then, um, then you would, that will be the fastest way, so to say. In, at the age of 37, I, 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 I didn't call myself a feminist. I heard, and, and I'm a bit embarrassed. My daughter has been a feminist since she was 12, uh, but I wasn't because I had this idea that I, I, I was been strong, that I should take the fight and I can always take the fight. And, and, but I was so punished and so hurt before I understood, uh, before I, I got my glasses. And the pain that came to me when I got those glasses is still so present in my body. When I was thinking of my, the, the headmaster of my, when I had my education who forced me to do an abortion to take care of my career, 
to didn't let me take care of my baby. I had to leave my baby at home when she was six weeks because all they would throw me out for my education. There were so many things during my life that had never put them in relation to feminism. It was just, I have to be better to stay in my career. I have to fight harder. I have to be better, et cetera, et cetera. Luckily, I, I, I started to learn. And today I'm very proud of, of to say I'm a feminist. And yeah, so why did I share all that with you? I think doing the change, I always think of it on three levels, the structural level. And, and that was happened, what was happened to me when I became a feminist, I suddenly started to see the structural level. Before that, I didn't see it. I only saw the relational level and my individual level. But when I found out, and, and it was actually a conversation I had with, with a professor, because I heard him say, he, he, stu he's a professor, he studied norms. He said, and I was into sustainable development. He said, today we have unsustainable development. If we want to have sustainable development, we have to change our norms. And at that time, me being very engaged in sustainable development, I had this impression that everyone always talked about doing more or less of what was already existing. We have to have less uh, carbon uh, footsteps. We have to have more ecological. It was always in this capitalism concept, but I had this feeling, this is not enough because it's just the same, but different. But when she, he said that about changing norms, I was like, wow, what does that mean? So I, I called him and then I had, I had a meeting with him and a four hours conversation. And I remember that my brain was hurting. It, oh, because he really, he really taught me about, he painted a picture for me that I had, hadn't seen before. And when he was finished, I said, but if what you say it's true. It's not only me that is wrong. It's the world that is wrong. And what I'm doing, it's actually really good. I've been struggling my whole life to challenge these unsustainable norms without knowing it. So he so gave me a spine in a way to continue to trust that my feelings when something is wrong, that I should trust it and, and dare to... to, to to follow that, so yeah, and then uh, I can continue and continue. I don't know how, how much time. Give me some minutes more because I didn't. Yeah, five. Okay. From from that point, I I really made a decision that I would like to invest part of my life for the big change and to do what I can to bring something to this world that I don't know what it is because and I, I, when I had a conversation with you yesterday, uh, uh, Marcella, I was thinking we talk a lot about mystery and I think that is what we share. The reality uh, and the, the history uh, or, or the present and the history gives us, a, paint us a very clear picture what is wrong. You don't have to be Einstein to point out what doesn't work because when it's imbalanced, the, the, the resources are imbalanced, imbalanced, that is wrong. And, and when someone thinks they are better than someone else, that is wrong. It's no, no rocket science to find out what is wrong. The rocket science is to dare to stand up and say, we have a problem and we want to do th something to, about it. That is, I think, the most important step. And, and to dare to say that very often challenge you should not bite the hand that feeds you. Who will uh, exclude me if I dare to stand up and say what I see? Will I be alone? Will I don't have any job? Will I don't have any money? It will really challenge a lot of existential ground uh, uh, things that you need in your life. And I think that daily challenge. And then I come back to this, should I choose this room where it's easy and lovely and these chicken ghost bumps or should I dare to get into this room to point out and say my meaning and take that risk and honestly, I don't know. 
I must say, even if I do this all the time, it's still a, a very big mystery, which is the most efficient way to contribute to change, because that's what I want. But I also want to have a life, of course, that works for myself. And I want to have relations that works for myself. So I, and, and though I'm, today I'm not working so much as an artist, sometimes I do, but I work as a producer. I have the privilege to work with a lot of artists. I also work as a coach. So I also have the privilege to work with a lot of storytellers. And one thing I have learned from working with art and with artists is that art is something that doesn't exist when it starts. It's someone who get an impulse from their body and start to project a picture on the future that yet don't exist. But then you start a journey towards create the existence and hopefully, and in our industry, you have people going with you because it's a collect collective work to create this. The reason I started to think of this is because I work as a pitch coach. And the thing when, when you are creating a production, even if it's built on mystery and questions, as I described it, and you can't see it, you have to be very clear and describe it very clear for the financiers. So it's a dilemma there because you have to describe something that shouldn't be described because the, the whole point with art is that you can't see it at the same time you have and, and I love this dilemma and I hate it it's 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 really a double feeling a mixed feeling about that and yeah I think what I will bring now is is the importance of confusion and, and the, the importance of us sharing confusion confusion but uh, and maybe about the process not about the goal because if you know the problem you somehow know the concept of the goal but now i would say something and i told you yesterday marcella uh, and maybe this is to say something very bad for our course but i was really afraid that we should manage to reach 50 50 because i couldn't imagine living in a world that is like this world, but 50-50, because there are so many other things in the structures that are wrong. So the risk that if we say, okay, now we have 50-50, check, we're done, scare the shit out of me, because the change I'm requiring is so much bigger than that. And, and the mystery of that change is what I would like to sh share with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was, again, like a lot of food for thought. And um, thank you very much for this um, and for sharing your uh, personal and professional um, uh, heart with us. <laughs> uh, so, Marcella, I'm sure you'll, um, you have a, a lot to, uh, to say about it as well. Would you like to share with us? Um, yeah, I mean, very hard to follow up on these two very inspiring women. So. Uh, I feel very lucky to and honored to be here with them. Um, very, very accomplished women. And uh, yeah, it's just an honor. Honestly, I feel like I'm learning so much just by being part of like this process and this panel, like the reflections that Maud sent, sent us to like think about were also very, very, very good. I feel like for me in a professional level and also in a, in a personal level as a woman and as a woman that works with, with film. Um, I come a little bit, I guess, from a different background than uh, Amanda and Helen. Um, I am not a scholar. Uh, and I'm also, I, I feel like this whole process has been making me reflect, am I an activist or am I not? I feel like I, I still have not answered that question for myself either. Uh, but maybe just for the people who are part of the panel too, I'll just talk very briefly a little bit about our uh, production company, uh, Adato. So we are a small studio in Amsterdam uh, and we work mainly with animation and new media. And we are very lucky to be in a production team made up of only women at the moment. Uh, so we have like four in-house producers who are all women. And it's been a very great um, learning process and a very great like um building of this team and it happened very organically and it's been a very interesting experience to work in this in this medium and with these people and building this team that is very like 
um, very strong and that it supports each other. And we work, we make um, we make documentaries and animations and new media. And our previous work that finished last year was called Queer in a Time of Forced Migration, which was a multimedia uh, series that started back in 2016 that tells the story of different uh, LGBTQ refugees that come to Europe. So it was a very documentary based uh, project. And now we're working on a couple of different projects. We're doing our first fiction project, uh, which is in development right now. We're very excited about that. And I feel like for, for our company um, in our studio, what we try to do, we try to tell stories that often are not told, but not only that, we also try to tell stories that we wanna hear. Um, so I guess it's kind of, it happens very fluidly in the sense of like, what do we wanna tell, but what would, what would we also wanna watch? Um, and I feel like that really inspires our work and moves us forward. Um, and I feel like one of the things that I talked to Helen yesterday about as well, and us thinking about like, okay, um, how do we make inclusive and diverse uh, content? I feel like it comes hand in hand with like having an inclusive and uh, diverse behind the camera kind of like situation, you know? I feel like, and this is where the whole reflection that I've been going through kind of comes in place. It's like, are we activists because we are making the content we want to make? Um, it happens very unconscious in a way as well, but it does end up being like this more, I guess, diverse content. But it comes because behind the camera we have such like a diverse and like a lot of well, a lot of women working in there, but a lot of like women from different backgrounds. We have like uh, our creative director Tamara, who's like a black woman. We have like a lot of people from our staff is like uh, Latina. So it, it comes very organically how we create our work, but then it comes in place this whole reflection. It's like, I feel like we need to have diversity behind the camera as well to bring forward more diverse work also. Um, and yeah, and one of the things that I actually really wanted to hear more about like the other panelists, Helen and Amanda, because they have like very um, great careers behind them and ahead of them. So I feel like, especially coming from a place of like production and like I'm a, I'm a young producer, I feel like a lot of the times people around me and uh, like uh, that are starting up in like the film industry, it's very hard, I think, for young people to take a stance and like really become like activists and like find their voice within the industry. I'm lucky enough that the company that I work for really wants to create content that I feel very proud about as well. But um, it, that's not the case for everyone. So I feel like uh, there needs to be a conversation about how do we keep like young filmmakers motivated and how do we help people create their voice when they have so when they don't have a lot of space yet or they don't feel empowered to do so that's kind of the question i wanted to pose thank you very much um is there uh, someone who wants to react to this uh question in the panel yes <laughs> i do please marcella that was uh, just brilliant. I just want to say you are the future of the industry, right? Mm -hmm. You know that. Um, and that makes me a very happy person uh, for someone who's been at this for a while. What I can say is the current project that I'm working on puts me in dialogue a lot um, with Black and Indigenous filmmakers in Canada that are like mad as hell and not going to take it anymore. The change is coming now. We are not asking for permission and all kinds of really impressive political activism is yielding different kinds of policies. And they've now, you know, the indigenous screen office is open and the black screen office is open and we have BIPOC film and television, which is a new advocacy group. And we have uh, the racial equity media collective, which is a new, a new advocacy group. And it's just, the sector right now is alive with change. And I will tell you that change is not coming from people in their fifties. That change is coming 
from young filmmakers and the next generation. And there is um, a view because, he, you know, uh, act, it, Maud, I think you're right on this. Academics are extremely good at critiquing structures and being cynical, uh, not always good at, at being optimistic and imagining a better future. I feel pretty optimistic right now about what's happening, at least in the Canadian industry. And I think the trick is right now to make sure it sticks. Um, yeah. and, and that's a, a generational challenge because like you can't, I can't not be an academic. We've been here before, haven't we? We haven't quite, I think, been at this particular type of reckoning where intersectional inequality um, is really important and um, that we must understand when we're arguing about gender equality that that must in fact foreground women whose voices have been long marginalized, women from the global south, indigenous women, queer women, disabled women, right? Um, so how do we, so it, it, I think it's different in texture, but the emphasis for gender, the push for gender equity in screen-based storytelling on and off screen is not a new fight. So how do we make it different this time? Can you guys please put me out of my research agenda? I would be really grateful, thank you. Yes, Ellen. You yeah, to... yeah. No, but uh, thank you, Marcella. And I was so inspired talking to you yesterday. And you said, "Yeah, maybe we're doing wrong because we're only hiring women." And and say, "No, you're not doing wrong. <laughs> you do what feels good for you." And and you know what I see. And I'm, in a way, I must also say this because I think ageism is a really big issue out there. I'm turning sixty this year. I'm so damn grateful for that because sometimes it's really good to have seen things over time because then you can see pattern and if i think something that always have provoked me myself is when people tell me what i need and they're not interested in me and my needs i love to be with people who ask me what do you need and i think that is i say that as i was involved in a in, in a mentoring program in the Middle East, there is a network called Sisters in Film that I really love. And I'm now also doing a project with this network. It's nine directors from seven countries in the MENA region. And when I was in Tunisia two years ago, and we did a lot of yeah, things together, and then we had one-to-one -one meetings. And then caveat from, um, from Qatar, from, from Egypt, I, she came to me and I said, okay, what do you need? And then she said, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking me what I need. I'm so provoked of all these people who tells me what I need. And I think that is something I have met in the structure. So let's go from individual to structure. I think we have a pattern in our financing structures that a lack of listening. And I love that you talked about that, Amanda, because I think that is really what's most needed right now, to listen to our creators, to listen to each other. And I think if the main goal, and if we could foster our supporting structures to ask filmmakers, what do you need? Because in this time of history, when distribution go through big changes, where production go through big changes and financing go through big changes, the truth is, that none of us knows what's going to happen tomorrow. The only thing we can know that there has always been a relation between storytellers and audience. And right now in history, we are in a place where, you know, before when you have theaters or opera houses, there was the privileged one who could be the audiences. That's not the fact today. Anyone can be an audience today. That tells us that audience today is anyone. <laughs> and that means that storytellers should, so to say, fulfill the needs for anyone, which tells us that we need a wide range. So you ask, what can we do for uh, to get more young filmmakers? We have to clean the table because what I have met as a coach, I'm 100% sure the biggest issue in our industry is not the artist because all the stories are there, all kinds of stories are there. They are maybe in different stages of development and experiences, but that's just training. That's just training. That's not a problem. The, the big problem 
that's the structures, the way the structures identify what is the success for tomorrow. And, and I love Johanna Collion and, and her Nostradamus report. And a couple of years ago, she said, do or die. And what how I read it, or I don't know, she, she's not sure if what she meant, but if you not change your structure today to be more relevant, inclusive and diverse, you will die. And I, I strongly believe in that. So that message to the structures, to you have to rethink how you meet this young talent, how you clean the table and start to listen. Even if they say something that's inconvenient in the way you think things should be done, because you look at yesterday's success and think this is the way how we end up in Cannes or end up in big box office. Forget about it. And start to listen. So, yeah, sorry. I feel like a pastor here because it's really. Um, Amanda, you wanted to say something. I'm kind of. Uh, are you change your mind? <laughs> or, no, um, I was just going to say what, like what Helene said. I mean, you know, this is hitting every single note on the series of interviews that I'm in the middle of right now. Um, I think that the pitching process is a bit of a black hole in terms of knowledge and data about how that becomes a fall off the cliff on numerous occasions. I've heard it's all stake, it's all sizzle, no stake. In fact, that if the performance of the pitch isn't good, the story itself doesn't matter. And when we talk about trying to, uh, as Helene said, what I really like about that is the problem isn't training people how to perform better for the executives, right? <laughs> the trick is to change what the financiers and the executives understand as good. So where is the, the focus and locus um, of, of power and influence understood and what is the problem itself understood to be? I like to use um, Carol Bacci. She's a, an Australian feminist policy scholar. And she argues, and I think that her policy analysis can travel across a whole range of different problems, as it were. Uh, she said, you know, how we understand a problem shapes how we choose or if we choose to act upon it. So we can then start to think about, well, if the problem, you know, the problem is, uh, you know, um, racialized women just don't have the right networks, right? then you're just going to continue to pump racialized women into a system, right? Of closed exclusionary networks that privilege a tiny minority of the population that's gonna be hostile. If you target the key gatekeepers who are in those networks who have the power to alter those networks and say, you need to open up your networks and you need to value different kinds of voices and talent within that network, that changes the locus of how we understand what the problem is. And I'm, I'm curious to hear um, um, if you have find, found a way to communicate with those executives and if they were actually um, or some of them were open to to changing the way that they um, that they value uh, pitching or that they value uh, projects and stories. Um, did you did you find a, an affirmative way to to change the way that they look at um, things? Yeah. Is, is that for me? I'd yeah, like that was to really no, I, like, I have a memory. I don't know if it answers your question, but this was my the first feature I produced. Actually, it was a director. I didn't find her on the street, but she started to make her feature herself. And I found her with three fourths were ready. I brought her to the Swedish Film Institute. And this is way before Anna Sana, I think. It's, I think this is in 2007 or something. And there was a scene in that film that she already had shot where a young girl, she's a neo-Nazi environment. She has a fight with the leader of this young boy, but he's with tattoos and muscles and she got pissed on this. So she take a can of beer and, boom, 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 and pour it over his head. And I said, and your feeling when you see that, oh fuck, she won't, she will, she, he will hit her, but he don't. And then, then I remember that I was, but this is not relevant. And then me and the director discussed this scene and she said, but I want it to be that way. And then I said, but that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool that she's not getting punished by doing things because I expected her to be punished. But she, 
And then when we came to this commissioning editor, he had exactly the same reaction as I had. But, but then a couple of months later, I told him, yeah, but we also expect women to be victim. So, and, and I had, then I told him about my reaction and then he went to his desk and he got his book and then he was looking and said, yeah, we had this course in gender and yeah, our expectations is that women should be victim and men will be perpetrated. Okay, I give you money. So that was so cool. His education and, and he, he forgot about it, but when I started to insist, he suddenly remember, yeah, in our course <laughs> at the Swedish Film Institute, we learned this. So, yeah. I was thinking of another thing uh, that was at the Power Inclusion Summit in New Zealand in 20, was it 2019? You, you, we have lost 2020, it's pretty strange. Uh, Stephen Canals, who is the screenwriter of Pose, the TV series, he made a most amazing keynote and he told us about his pitching process, how hard it was to, to pitch Pose, who takes place in the Vogue scene in New York, which everyone right now, we all know uh, RuPaul, uh, it's history, we all have knowledge, but at that time we haven't heard about it. And he couldn't, no one listened to him. And then he realized he had to educate the commissioning editors before he pitched his project. Yeah, Marcella, you, you wanted to say something. Um, well, I think, uh, yeah, that resonates just a lot, I guess, with like the experiences that like, I've had with pitching and stuff. A lot of the times it feels like you have to context contextualize and give a little bit of like, yeah, this education prior to making your pitch. But I feel like some people are very receptive to that. But at the same time, I feel like one of the things that frustrates us at least in the in the studio is that, for example, um, a few months back, there was like, I mean, there still has been a lot, but there's like this growing of like the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, you know, and this has been, there has been a lot of attention in the media and et cetera. And then when those things happen and when that is in the media or that's a hot topic, a lot of people come to us and they're like, oh, I wanna support your work, I wanna do this, this is really cool, what are you doing, blah, blah, blah. And then as soon as like the topic dies down a little bit, they're gone, you know, and it's like, you try to follow up and they, it's just like, you know, and that's that's very frustrating, I feel like. And maybe that's something we try to navigate and try to like we're trying to create like strategies to kind of navigate those situations. But that's something I feel like that's still very frustrating, at least within this like production angle. And the other thing that you guys were talking about that I think is super relevant to is like this whole networking and like the gatekeepers of the network. I feel a lot of the times for example, we work a lot with technology, right? So you need to work with developers. And we always try to look for women developers as well, but it's really challenging to find women developers. We've been lucky enough to work with a lot of women animators. So that has been really great. And like, we've actually found those networks and those connections, but women developers, we have worked with one before, but it's way more challenging to find those. And it's like, how, how do we navigate this? How do we find these people? You know, Because we know they exist. And they are out there. It's, there's so many developer, developers. Of course, there are women developers out there. But for some reason, it's so hard to find them. And I just don't understand why. It's so frustrating. Yeah, is this a, a way of uh, how women sell themselves or, or how, yeah, yeah, Helen? Sorry, you, I, this is really the subject I think a lot of now, but I hear so much. I think and I, I try to have examples. I think what I what I see, it's when you, and the first thing I was thinking of, I'm working with, with a director of a color uh, right now, uh, and we are developing a project together. And, and I spoke to her yesterday and she told me about the program that the Swedish Film Institute did some years ago to recruit uh, filmmakers of color. She, she was very well experienced, but she had this impression. She was the wrong kind of colored person. She did a wrong, she was mo maybe the most well-educated person that applied, but the people they picked was really cool people. People that had no experience of the film industry, but they were maybe a very cool blogger. They had very much position and attitude and some kind of 
street I don't know, industry credibility, which was quite interesting because I, I was thinking, I was, yeah, she's right. Because the result was that maybe one of them made a film after that program. And that is, so what I, why I'm saying that listening to you, I think well, I'm, one thing I've learned as a pitch coach, because Amanda said something about the story, uh, you know, the, 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 how much do the story matter when you pitch? From my, this is ugly what I'm gonna say now, but I've seen it so many times. I, I think there's three dimensions of a pitch. One is your position, one is your story, and one is your direction. And the story should, of course, be the most important, but it's not. What I see is that your position, because I can see people with a good position be financed for bad stories. And I see people with no position, with fantastic stories, they don't get any money. That tells me that the truth out there, your position is more important than the story you tell, which is ugly. And as a pitch coach, I always have to so, some kind of create an image of, of a position, <laughs> you promise a position. So the feeling of those who will invest in you, they will be scared. If you miss that, you will be the one who miss Beatles or ABBA, you know, the fear of missing out vibe. Um, yeah, and then the third thing I'm thinking of is when, because it doesn't matter how you ask a question, when you ask for people, I don't know if that goes for tech people, but my best example is something we had in Sweden, also before Anna Sana, many years ago, we had the Rookie Project. Swedish Film Institute decided to, to uh, find new talent. So they, they had money for eight feature films. Uh, quite low, but not that low. Low budget, but okay budget. Okay, eight. And then that you could apply for this. Uh, and the first seven was made by men. So when you had one film left to say, hmm, Houston, we have a problem. It's not okay that we use all this money to develop male talent. So then it was a dedicated question. And, and, and of course, they were, were questioned, why, didn't, why, why is it only men? Yeah, because the script we got from women wasn't good enough. Then with the eighth film, they decided to ask for, for a, a, a female director, they got, I think they got 60 applications. And what I, the rumor I've heard that 40 of these applications was good. Three of these films was then made. One was Tribeca winner, one was premiered in Venice, and I don't remember the third one, but these three films was actually if only one of them was financed, but they were somehow, uh, they, they found them through the Rookie Project. And that tells us when you ask the questions in the right way, the products are there. That's my truth. Can I just support what Helen just said very briefly? Um, just with a little bit of empirics. So Netflix put out a call in Canada mm, late last year, somewhere late 2020, for stories from diverse storytellers. They were looking for new talent, the Canadian pitch contest, they called it. 10,000 submissions, they broke the algorithm. <laughs> Don't tell me there's a shortage of stories out there. That's not the problem. And just a, a quick, uh, I guess, uh, also um, quick note on this too. And I think this goes back to what we were talking about before. I feel like having women in, le in leadership positions everywhere kind of helps things, I feel like, move, you know, and like these diverse stories being told because it, it can't be just like women creators, but I feel like it has to be women executives as well. And like all, all of, I feel like all of the industry has to have like women as, in leadership positions. I feel like that's what brings about change and gives voice to diverse stories as well. But I would add that it's really important that that leadership uh, infrastructure isn't simply just more white women, right? We have really strong evidence 
that people, particularly in positions of influence, who make investment decisions about stories, invest in stories that they find relatable, <laughs> which is probably a huge part of the reason why we've ended up in the mess we're in today. Now, the other piece of the puzzle that I think is really interesting and noteworthy on some of the work that I'm doing right now is there's a big distinction coming up and this is probably, we don't have time to go into the depth of this between cinema and television. And there seems to be a lot of optimism about the potential of TV to fundamentally disrupt um, how the system works for a bunch of reasons. One, there's just more of it, right? The TV business is being fundamentally disrupted with the streamers and global distributions. The relationship with audiences is much tighter. There's more diversity of content. We're now seeing, in fact, the pandemic at one level has been an accelerant in driving content from all around the world through new channels. So how do we take this as an opportunity, right? To, despite all of the tragedy, obviously, of COVID-19, which cannot be underestimated. Um, but to think about, um, and the scale of TV is changing, right? We, we've seen this in the last 10 years. Some TV series now have bigger budgets, but you have feature film budgets on TV series. Um, so it's no longer, you know, the crummier storytelling version by definition. And you have movie actors and directors doing TV. So how do we take that as an opportunity to fundamentally change, to make affirmative change, right, Maud? No, well, I think, That's oh, I, I love this. Thank you, Maud, for bringing us together. This is so inspiring. I'm, I'm so happy to hang around with Marcella, you and, and Amanda right now. I think, I think I thought a lot about this because this director, you know, with a can of beer, uh, a lot of uh, financiers told her, you shouldn't do a feature, you should do, um, you should do a novel, you should do 30 minutes, you should not go directly to a feature. And for her, it was really important because her dream was to make a feature film. That was, that was to do the impossible. And, and it ended up very well. She was, she got world recognized for, for the film when it was ready several reasons I won't get into, but I think she did right. And I think as an artist, it's really important to follow your dream. Of course, sometimes these dreams are connected to get acknowledged by existing system. And especially if you feel that you're outside the system, you want to prove for yourself, I can do that. I think that is something we all have and we have to fight towards that because I want to have that position. I want to, to have that prize, et cetera. And, and that is somehow in our ecosystem. We are, I think an artist is somehow mostly a bit competitive, but because you want to reach something, you want to reach out. The, the danger is not to use this energy towards each other or against each other is to use it to reach out because it, it can be very healthy I think but that is also it's also dangerous and, and uh, yeah can we do something and, and but I also sorry for being messy now but I see I hear a lot of young filmmakers say I'm not interested in a, in a, a premiere in Cannes I'm interested to reach an audience on, on internet directly. There are people who, who come in with new dreams, but these old dreams are still very dominant. And the funding structures also, it's easier if you can somehow promise someone, I will promise you a premiere in Cannes, you will probably get the funding. If you say, I can promise you that I will have a million followers on YouTube, it will probably be a bit harder to get the funding. Uh, have you had a million follower before? Maybe, but so, so this is really the thing. What kind of goals are prioritized? And that's what I'm, uh, I really would love if we could talk about goals, the film I make, what will it do? Because that's what you talked about before, Amanda, you talk about the impact of our stories. And, and, and what do our stories do with the world? We don't talk enough about that, I think. And I think that is something we should talk about. The story you are creating, because you, you can't know it, but as 
as an artist, I, I will always thought I, like this when I was an artist, that I'm here and my crew is here and here is the screen or the TV or whatever. And there you have the audience. I can plan and control this distance. But this distance, I can't plan and control. I can only dream. And my way to find the best art was always to think, these people here in the audience, what do I want to happen inside them when they watch my story? What do I urge for them? And I always had the same story. Uh, and maybe that is the story from my mother. And I think all the films I have produced have the same thing. I want people to believe that they are more of themselves. That is always my goal. And I think different artists have different goals, but I think that will benefit us all. If I can make you feel valuable, then I have succeeded with myself. Oh my God, this is, this is so interesting, but also so complex. And I don't know if it's complicated. Is it complicated, Marcel and Amanda? The, I, yeah, I do think it's a, it's a, com it's really complicated, and that's why I, I wanted to have this, um, the seminar series in three parts because it's, it's all well, all the parts of a, of a film uh, will kind of um, make what the audience see, right? And and this question of what is the impact of my film, it's. Um, I don't know, it's the golden graal in a way, um, if we knew. <laughs> yeah, but there is also a contradiction. Sorry for interrupting, but there is also a contradiction because a, a commissioning editor, editor is scared as hell to ask about that. And they should be because at the same time you have this with artistic integrity. And as a commissioning editor, you should not, so to say, rule an artist. So this is also something that must be up to the artist. So it's also a difficulty because if you see the reactions, what happened in Sweden, when Anna started to be very clear that we won't change, we talk about identity politics and, she, and, and then you're not allowing, allowing all kinds of stories. It has been a success internationally, but it has been hell also for Anna and for, for this movement in Sweden, because there's a lot of people that provoke that you start to get into and, 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 and pick into the stories. And, and Amanda, I don't know what you say about that, but it's... You know, I just, um, I'm sensitive that we might have questions um, oh. or, or Maud, I feel like we're, uh, but I just, to that point, I wanna, when you said something, Helene, uh, earlier that, you know, um, being an activist is, is hard work because you're going to make people angry, right? Um, you know, there is sort of one of that, that old adage of, well, you know, if I'm not pissing anybody off, then I must not be doing anything, right? But I yeah. had another activist today um, talking about a very specific, difficult challenge um, that um, is confronting a particular community right now. They something extremely powerful and they said, we have to lean into our fear a little bit on this one. And, you know, like when you talk about your chicken skin, that gave me goosebumps. I thought that's right. It's, there is a level of bravery that is required um, in order to go ahead sometimes into the unknown where you are, anytime you go into disrupt existing power relations, there is going to be resistance from those who benefit from the system as it currently stands. Every time that you go into advocate for a community and with a community and with a set of interests, no community is cohesive and agrees on everything. Right, so there is going to be internal discord and disagreement. You know, a fantastic example of that is the, the quota debates within the feminist community. You know, the feminist community it, in screen industries is not a unified cohesive voice by a long shot. So I think that um, that's a really nice element to point out um, in, in your, in your journey as an activist and an international leader uh, in this space. And indeed, Marcella, um, as 
one of the content creators that is on the cutting edge of the kinds of stuff that needs to be made that everybody who knows what's worthy making right now is you're sitting at the front end of it. Um, that's a hard position to be in because you've got value. You're trying to convince people of your value and the value of your work when all kinds of other people can see it, except, you know, Helen, you're totally right. Well, that's great that you have a million and a half viewers on YouTube, but you know, how many, can you get a premiere at Khan where 35 people are gonna see your film, right? That's lunacy, like that is lunacy about how we understand success metrics. Well, it's only on TikTok. Yeah, but like yeah, a million people follow me. You know, I'm on Twitch, I'm still, like, that's content. So all of, it, it, again, it's back to that disruption and we have to, to query and reset the structures itself. And I really like the, oh my God, what if we get to 50-50 and all we've done is change the head count? How awful would that be? So yeah. I agree. That was exactly my thought as well. Um, when um, when I, I saw, oh, now it's 2020, what now? <laughs> but no, it ha it wasn't reached. And um, and in a way, I'm a bit glad for it, as uh, as Helen said. So I'm. Um, uh, there is a, a question from uh, from the audience, um, and also I'm um, I'm actually more I'm actually interested in um, in seeing how. Um, or in talking more about how uh, people that have been discriminated against for a long, long time in history um, can feel or can feel that they can um, uh, sell themselves enough to be heard. Um, I it's it seems to be um, uh, it's a matter of changing the executives as as we have said, and not only by white women, but having uh, more diversity of people in uh, in positions of power. Um, and and also of inspiring confidence, um, I guess. Um, Helen, you wanted to react about this. Actually, Amanda is first, so so let Amanda start. I'm happy to yeah. comment. I'm just <laughs> curious what Amanda will say. <laughs> um, I think. Thank you. Let me take my hand. Oh, my hand is down. Um, look, the question from Annette is it is a humdinger of a question. It's a great one. Let me speak uh, to the question of how do we change the executives? And I'll give you an example from an interview that I did just this week in which I was speaking with um, an executive who is a woman who is advocating for change, um, who has a very long and storied career in the global screen industries and is anchored out of the US. And I, she talked about the pipeline for executives, right? And, and making a really concerted effort to bring in racialized women and queer women and make sure that that pipeline gets full. And I said, okay, let me ask you this. When we talk about global talent searches, um, we have extremely well-developed, very sophisticated film and television production industries all around the world. When we go looking for executives, are we recruiting from South America? Are we recruiting from India? Are we recruiting from Nollywood? How does that recruitment happen? Because if you're only looking at the pipeline within your own shores, then you're actually not really committing to effective change. And my issue is then we get back to the pipeline problem, right? As if, well, we just all have to be patient and wait for people to get enough skills. Uh, and the answer was, mm, no, no we, no, we don't really recruit globally. So that was a new piece of information that I got out of my research today. And I thought it was very telling and powerful about who is, who the, the, how global is the talent pool? Where do we see that talent coming from? Because Helen, like you said, lots of, you can teach people how to do their jobs, right? 
like learning how to navigate the particular institutional infrastructure of a different company is not rocket science. And we know that because other global industries do it all the time. So I would throw that back onto the laps of the studios who like to say that they're deeply committed discursively to the question of equity, diversity, and inclusion, ask them to take an extremely careful lens at their own hiring practices at the top end and what that tells us about their depth of commitment to this change. So maybe that's a campaign. Uh, oh, I love this. I think I would suggest, you know, I don't know if you remember that I said that I look at the, I think I look at my life, but I also look at the industry from three levels. You have the structural level, I have my individual level, and then I have the relation level. And if I start to talk about the structures, um, and I can share a story. Before I met, this, no, it was actually the first years because this professor I told you about who told me uh, that when I had this feeling, if what you're saying is the right, it's not only me that is wrong. Maybe I'm the one who's right and the system is wrong. That was a swap in my body to understand and to, to be confident being who I am, even if I can be in pain in the ass for someone, but it's for me, it was comfortable. So... A couple of years later, I had this feeling that I was, I have a big stone that I tried to get up on a big mountain. And then uh, sometimes, and, the blah, 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 and then I try it again. And then I, I but, and that was my individual fight with the systems. And then I, I, I told him this feeling and this picture I had. And then he said, no, 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 you can never fight a system that is rotten. That was the word he used. He didn't. He he, he didn't said. I, I asked him, "Is the systems dead?" No, no, they're not dead. They're rotten. You you just have to wait for them to die. So, oh my God, that's. But he said, "Never fight a rotten system. You have to learn to sheet the system. You have to make yourself like water." If I saw the system as a big mountain, not you should not be a stone. You should be water blah, 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 and floating around this mountain. That was a very strong picture he gave me that I, I used to think of when I, I find myself getting into these fights with the system. Uh, so that's part of the picture. Then inside myself, when I pitch something and I know this position thing, I, I'm gonna tell you a secret. On my CV, I have a premiere in Cannes, but I, bought that premiere. I can, I can, if we meet Annette, I saw it was you who asked this question, I can tell you all the details, but most things are for sale. Uh, and if you really go for something that can give you a position in other people's eyes, um, of course you should not all go and, and buy a, a, a premiere in Cannes and it's maybe not possible, but what I'm trying to say, these things that, are illusions and you as an artist can always play with illusion and I think what you have to do is upgrade yourself. The first work I do as a pitch coach is to try mostly when I get into a room with someone who, who's going to learn to pitch they feel very small towards the system. So the first thing I have to do is to change that relation of power. And, and sorry now for my filthy mouth, but I say, you cannot be the one who's getting fucked. You have to be the one who fuck. You have to be on top of this situation. It's maybe a bit uh, radical to say, but people understand very quickly what I mean. And you can see in their eyes that they start to imagine themselves. And I also say, you have to look at the people in power as three years old to make yourself bigger inside yourself, but also to what you say should be very, very clear because your job is to make them feel smart. So it's very technical. It's, it's, very, it's very technical to get into these relations of power. Uh, and I think it's very easy to feel disempowered in a situation where everything looks impossible. 
So I'm not saying that it's easy to say, okay, I decide to be in charge of this and, and look at them as more. No, no, no. It's very, very difficult. That's why we need coaches sometimes to hold our hands and to make this decision and to see what's out there is not healthy. <laughs> But I have to deal with it if I want to be here. And it's and we should also remember it's not a, a human right to be a filmmaker, uh, even if it's a human need. It, it's yeah, this is so tricky. But I think she the system and and yeah, but because I was talking about the individual and the systemic, the structural level. What I have done in my, I, I'm actually the president of WIFTI, and that is for me the the middle level, the relational level. The best thing you could do is to build relations that supports you. And I think that's why networking is crucial in my life. This is the room where I can be, I can, if I, if I wouldn't have whiffed in my life, I would be such a pain in, in the ass in all the situations in my life. Whiffed is my space where I can express all the problems I see and play with all the solutions I see together with other people that share the same idea of, about problems and the needs for solutions. If I wouldn't have whiffed, I would probably have been killed or something because I would have been such an asshole in all these situations. So, yeah. Hi, we've just got another question from the audience. Uh, so I'll just read that out for you. Uh, so it says, thank you so much for this wonderful webinar and for sharing all your stories and work. Uh, living in a country where English is not the main spoken language, I'm curious to hear about your experiences with multilinguality in the film industry. Have you encountered challenges in decentering Anglo-centric and English speaking experiences in international world cinema? and ways of overcoming those challenges through feminist approaches and spaces. And then following on relating question, how do you see language related factors influencing what projects are able to find financial support, resources and distribution when films are not in English? Amanda. <laughs> I, this, um... This question is an incredibly important one and speaks to me very deeply because I am Canadian and Canada is a bilingual country. English and French are our two official languages. We call the English and French um, divisions within the country, the two solitudes. And the political economy of the Canadian English film and television industry and the French film and television industry are incredibly different and highly charged um, for all kinds of reasons. I wanna preface this by saying, I think that this is important. This is a, one of the most pressing questions that the industry is going to have to wrestle with, not simply from a commercial standpoint, right? Because we're leaving money on the table, and again, the pandemic is starting to challenge some of these things. So we're seeing lots more, lots more content, for example, on Netflix in foreign languages that's now being subtitled or dubbed. So, you know, without trying to be um, overwhelmingly uh, pessimistic, I think that again, there's an opportunity here within the structures for us to be able to be again, to crack open some spaces. How we do that, is really important. And I think that requires some new ideas that capture imaginations um, that connect us and, un, and frame the questions in compelling ways that connect not just the commercial imperative, but the social, economic, and cultural imperative of the storytelling world on screen. Um, so, you know, what I'll say is that colonialism and the disenfranchisement of the other through our media system is one of the key means by which colonial white supremacy is reproduced under contemporary capitalism. Now that's, you know, a big idea to roll out, uh, but I think it's really important. And again, speaks to the comment that I just made. Why aren't we recruiting from India? Why aren't we recruiting from 
Mexico? Why aren't we recruiting from uh, these incredibly sophisticated global screen industries that are sitting loaded with talent? So that tells me a lot of things about how flows of power and influence run in and through the structures and networks that underpin production. So the Indigenous Screen Office in Canada um, is advancing a very powerful case for something that they call narrative sovereignty. And this has captured a lot of political attention and I think advances an interesting idea into the political sphere that is quite hard to say, well, that's not worth doing, particularly in the context of Canadian First Nations, French and English relations. And that is that indigenous um, screen writers and screen tellers, writers and filmmakers say, look, there is a system that very carefully protects and supports English language production and French language production. By the way, we were here first. We never ceded the land. We would like the same structures, regulatory and policy and funding structures to support our stories. That's all we're asking for is basic equity. And, but the idea of narrative sovereignty over your stories, over who tells your stories and the right to tell those stories and the right for those stories to be circulated as part of the public sphere is an interesting proposition, I would suggest, that could have purchase in other contexts. Yeah, Helen? Yeah, I could add, and I was thinking of Parasite, the South Korean film that I think, I love the story of Parasite because who could expect that a South Korean film would take the world with such a storm. So that's that's gives hope, I think. And then I think when you talk about the First Nation uh, people, because uh, I there is something I love to see that is happening. And I Lisa Holmby and Anna Laila Utsi, who are running the Sapmi Film Institute, they are such a cool boss ladies, and they are a gift to all of us what they are doing, and. Uh, I know because I, I when I arranged Carla 2020, the, the network about diversity, I asked Lisa to put together a panel uh, uh, about, um, I don't know what we call it, indigenous storytelling, I think it was. And it took her no time to put together her friends from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, US and Greenland, like this, because they all work together. They, they, they have a network and a friendship and a professional collaborations over the globe in a way that I don't see anywhere else. So when you say this, Amanda, that we should look for other voices, uh, yeah, and that's the, when you belong to an oppressed group, doesn't mean you have to act like an oppressed towards the, the, the structures that uh, have, that oppress you. You can find other ways. And I think what they have done all over the world, the network the indigenous have makes me jealous in a way, because I think they're super cool and smart when they do their production. And I, I love to be jealous because jealous always turns me on to try to do something. So that I was thinking of. And then I must brag a bit because I'm very proud of what we did at this year's Berlinale our event at the Berlinale, it was an old dream of me since I became the international president. Of course, I love to bring people together. And our title was Love is All You Need, Reimagining Rom-Com. And then we have from Bollywood, Nollywood, Hollywood. And that was my dream. That was so fun to play with words, but it's also very interesting. It was a collaboration between WIFT India, WIFT Africa and Nigeria, WIFT Los Angeles, Sweden and, and Germany. So it was also this dream to bring people together, network again. But it was now I lost what to say. Give me a second. I have to remember. There was a point there somewhere. No, I don't remember. Maybe Marcella, do you want to say something about this um, non-English uh, speaking um, or? Yeah. yeah, I remember it. May I say it? Sorry for interrupting. What I want to mention is that Bollywood 
is the biggest economy, then we have Nollywood, then we have Hollywood, and this kind of pictures to see, because if you go for the money, you have an economical system. Sorry, I leave it to you again. I wanted to. Um, well, in this, I guess in this, like, it, it's, it's difficult. I mean, our production company is based in mainly in Amsterdam, uh, which is that we're in uh, the Netherlands. It's a Dutch speaking country. Uh, but most, so I, I feel like the question had a lot to do with how do we navigate this, right? And how do we navigate like making maybe films that are not in English and how do we, we expand this? And honestly, I think it's really hard. I don't think it's an easy thing. And even in this whole like connection thing and networking thing, like, yeah, we want to, well, I work. I'm Brazilian, I, I come from Brazil, I work here, but the reason why I work here is because I speak English. There is no doubt about that. And I feel like we can pretend that that is not a reality. It's easier to make connections when you can speak the same language naturally. Uh, but I, and I do feel like here, I don't speak Dutch. I don't think anyone in our studio speaks Dutch. So that adds another level of like complications because we get some funding from the Netherlands and then we make stuff in English, but then they also want a Dutch version. So now we're having to navigate that as well. And then there's a third level now that we're making another film in Spanish because all of our, like most of our producers also speak Spanish. Uh, I speak Portuguese, Spanish as well. Then like Tamara, she's like Panamanian American. So she speaks Spanish. Our other producers are Argentinian, so she speaks Spanish. So there's that now. And I feel like that project actually started making me a little bit more hopeful in the sense of like, okay, we are, we all speak English to each other, but we're based in the Netherlands, a, a country that speaks Dutch, and we're making a film in Spanish. So that I think it's cool. Like, I feel like finally, for the first time, I see us breaking a little bit of like this whole like, English centric and networks that are in English and English blah blah blah. We're now we're talking to animators that speak Spanish. We're like we're working with a crew that speaks Spanish and like it really opened horizons. So I feel like our world is so connected, but it's still very like centered around like English and like English poles of like networking and work and etc. But more and more I see that expanding also because more people speak English, but also because I think these relations are getting stronger like letting people wanting to work together and creating a more like fortified link between each other and creating this. I feel like that's what we're talking about. It's like the relations and the networks and like building things together. So I feel like a lot of times, like Helen, you were talking about before, sometimes the system is like rotten or whatever, but you start creating also, I feel like your own system, like outside of like, of course you depend on uh, to some extent to like what already exists, but you can also start creating your own thing and your own little like network and that expands and that connects to something else. So I feel like it's all about those links. So I feel like it is like a very exciting time to be working on. And there's still a lot of a lot of um, obstacles, especially for like non-speak non-English speaking folks. But I see that there is an opening finally for that. At least that's how I see it. Yeah. May I give you some feedback on that? Because I think your company also focusing on tech not yeah. only storytelling. And I think that is also a factor that is really interesting and, and it's totally right. You have this global view that you just described, but you also get into tech to see what's happening with the distribution because stories will be distributed in ways we can't imagine today, tomorrow. I'm, I'm quite sure about that. And, and yeah. getting into tech, I think that is really clever. Uh, yeah. yeah. The, the te I feel like the tech, part of the industry it's very interesting as well because it is so small um it's small and big at the same time it's the weirdest thing to navigate because you you hear about things you never thought existed before and then you're in a place and then you meet someone and you think okay yeah. is it the same four people that make vr but yeah. there's so much out there and it's like it's very weird it's very yeah. weird. May, may, I, may i share a story because i started when i decided to to be a producer and, and deal with power and money i decided to start a tv channel on internet in 2000 and i managed because when i want to do something i just managed so i yeah 
but the thing it was this big the, the film and almost no audience but then there was a fair in london about streaming because streaming was new at that time you know who the big innovators were at that time those who were in the forefront of the techniques can you guess that was it's, really, it's really interesting but if you think when you oppress and i'm this is very <laughs> double because when you oppress a force uh, doesn't say it good or bad that's not what i'm going for but when you oppress something you usually find ways and that creates innovation and it was the porn industry they were really in the forefront when it comes to techniques so yeah i, I can see your eyes because it was totally shocking but in a way you can learn something from it if you try to stop something it will always find ways and especially if you don't talk about it so so yeah this is a totally another discussion uh, but i i i just think it's interesting to reflect on because you said before why how can women find motivation to enter tech yeah maybe to stop porn i don't know could that be a motivation um, yeah, but I feel like that relates a lot to what we were even talking about yesterday. It's like in it feels like in adversity is where art thrives at the end of the day, right? The yeah. more that I feel like sometimes they don't want us to tell certain stories or don't want something to happen, that's when you want to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. like that's a big motivator. Yeah, also. yeah. No, but that's I heard someone say if you fund art too much, it, you you will it will disappear because is it true i don't like to say it but is this resistance also a very strong point for motivation i uh, have no idea amanda is the researcher among us maybe you know <laughs> um we only have five minutes left so i i'd like to encourage the audience to um not be shy and um and ask questions to a wonderful panelist before we um close for today um, but if there is no one that one that, that is inspired, we can continue. I, I, I have I feel forever. Um, it's an infinite debate. Don't you have any questions? Um, well, I have plenty of questions. I don't actually know where to start. Um, but what um, what I I really want to come back to this idea of quotas and um, the idea that that we focus a lot or we've focused a lot uh, lately on um, having quotas and on diver diversifying uh, people who are behind the, the camera. Um, but um, how does that really impact on uh, what we see on screen if we don't change the mentality? It seems that education has been something that also um, that also comes to um, to your mind when when we when we speak about this, because I feel that it's not because you give a camera to a woman that you only see things that are not misogynist. It's not, it's not as simple. Um, I don't know, maybe Marcella, you have something um, because you have applied for funding as well. Have you, uh, did you have the impression that your work was kind of placed in a quota of the diversity quota in a way or? I feel like, well, in the Netherlands, Specifically, there is a lot when we apply for funding here that is a lot that is taken into consideration in the sense of like what kind of films are we going to put forward and etc. Especially with grants, I feel like that's the situation like looking for diverse stories, looking for representation, etc. But more on like the commercial side that is very different. So I feel like those are very different spheres to navigate as well, kind of like grant funding or like more like commercial funding. Uh, I I don't I don't know exactly how to answer you in this. I feel like there is an unspoken quota a lot nowadays. Like I feel like kind of what I was talking about before. Like sometimes when Black Lives Matter is like the big topic, then everyone is like, okay, now we have to be inclusive. Now we have to do this and and stuff. So like there's a little bit of social pressure, but that doesn't really necessarily last or doesn't not always, sometimes maybe, but I feel like putting women behind the camera or putting like more like women of color or like more LGBT people in behind the camera and also in leadership positions that I feel like that does influence stories because 
at least from like my perspective, we in our in our studio, we want to tell stories, yeah, that are more diverse, but that speak to us, like the stories that we want to watch. And I feel like it, it's about that, you know, it's like what you relate to and what we were talking about before, like a lot of the executives of men. So they pick the stories that, that speak to them. So I feel like bringing diversity influences also, like behind the camera also influences directly on representation and diverse storytelling. Mm. That's kind of, at least my, my point of view. But you guys feel, feel free to also chime in. I think there was also another question, Emily, maybe you want to um, share it. Are you muted? Yes. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, so there's a couple of things in the in the chat. So uh, Sitara from Chennai, India um, says they have had worked for a decade in PVT television and have faced men, many gender inequality and power related issues. And as a result, I'm currently a PhD scholar in the end tale of finishing their thesis on child labor in Tamil reality television. Um, I'm here in this room among you, admiring and getting inspired from you. Let me thank you for this opportunity because it feels like an endangered species here in Tamil Nadu to have spent 10 solid years in the reality television industry and to change over to academics. Um, they are a victim of gender inequality and power politics in media. Um, as I understood too much of it, I finally distanced myself, though I'm channeling my experiences into autoethnographic research, I am undergoing a depression. I have fantasized media work, but I have understood there isn't much truth in it. So the, and then the question is, what's your say to the women who have worked or are working hard on the floor without recognition? I, I wrote an answer to Kitana. Uh, um, and I must say, I'm very sorry to hear your, about your experiences, but what I always do, I'm, I'm the president of WIFT, I encourage people to network. And if there are no networks, start a network. It's not difficult. And if you start a WIFT network, we are always there to support and help. Because I think you shouldn't be alone with this kind of experiences. And not being alone, I usually say you have to gather five, oh, sorry, I have a phone ringing in the background. You have to gather five women and you have to start to share things and decide to to organize because i think that's the way that's the best uh, advice i can give um, in in this case sorry i get a bit disturbed by my phone in the background i don't know if you have any other i i just like to say sathara that it sounds like you're doing incredibly important research on an area um, of the screen production industries that is grossly understudied, um, very much like the uh, industry, much of the literature that circulates in academic circles is English and focused on uh, mainstream, largely white labor markets. I have the total pleasure of working with Anuba Sarkar on my research team right now, who's just finished her doctorate on the political economy of the Indian film industry. Um, so I, I would a second uh, Helen's call to find allies and support systems locally where you are. Sadly, you are not alone. Um, although sometimes that space of exclusion and oppression is a very, but is always a very lonely space. So I support that. And I also support you in your doctorate. You're almost done. That's fantastic. That is no small feat. So you can find me um, on my Deakin institutional page and you feel free to reach out and we can have a chat about your research because I'm really keen to hear what you've come up with. Well, thank you very much. As long as, li as I'd like to uh, continue uh, chatting with you, awesome women, I have the impression that we've only started to um, um, 
uh, touch the tip of the iceberg, but it's already midday and um, I've promised this was only a two hour session. So I'd like to uh, let you go by to your day and your evening, Amanda. <laughs> Um, and I, I really want to thank you all uh, very, very much for um, accepting my invitation and taking part and uh, thank Emily as well for awesome work with um, organizing this um, seminar series as well with me. So thank you and uh, thank you for uh, the audience and um, uh, everyone who has been here uh, watching us today. And I hope you'll come back for the next um, seminars uh, that will take place next uh, Friday uh, from 11 to one. And can I just say thank you for setting up my next three Friday nights? Because even though we're not in lockdown anymore, I never go out anyway. And like, what a bunch of content this is. <laughs> Next week, I get to have a glass of wine and watch, which is going to be great. Yes. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, everybody. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for putting this together, too. You guys did amazing organizing it. Yeah, thanks for having us. It was fantastic. Thank fantastic. you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.